left out consistently from different forms of culture. Uh, in this work specifically, Natalie's been looking at uh, people who occupy different gender orientations that aren't necessarily accepted by the spaces they grew up in. She constructed a space, a room, that is a room full of stories, stories attached to objects. So as you navigate through the space, there are different objects that uh, have voices that uh, emanate from them. And those voices are real world stories that she's collected from her research subjects of their very intimate tales of the times that they first came out to parents or to friends or first felt that the world didn't quite fit them because of the way that they'd been born and how they feel. And so it's this very sensitive, intimate way of presenting other people's stories. You know, these aren't Natalie's stories, but the work itself shows Natalie's care for those people and her desire to give them a sensitive platform for other people to engage in. So let's just cross straight over here to Melissa Schwartz's postmodernist. So Melissa's been looking very deeply into critical ecologies, uh, thinking about extractive capitalism and about also poetics. And poetics is a phrase I'm going to be using a lot today, and it's really a term to, to reflect the use of poetry in critical contexts, I would say to think about the abstract and the metaphorical and what kind of communication medium and how that works. And I think Melissa's work has always been a good example of this, in this work specifically. She's looking at a lake in Germany called the Seychelles Lake, where there, it's kind of a hellscape of extractive capitalism. You know, it's a lake that's filled and produced by this kind of extractive, polluting industry that is churning its way through the earth. Um, Melissa's German, and this is a site that she visited herself and made all these documents herself, so she's got a lived experience of this. But she's also combining things like sat satellite imagery, you know, the imagery that we can access from wherever. So she's conflating these two different views, both the intimate lived view and the satellite remote view, while also at some point during this film, there's a split where she starts to compare this kind of strange ecological hellscape with the landscape of London through the medium of drawing our attention to these elements that she's drawn. Uh, things frozen in resin that came from the Lusatia Lake area itself, and also those things dredged up that sort of sit on the landscape of London. Things like different forms of trash, of stuff thrown away in the everyday. And she's trying to conflate both of those spaces in one through the film, while also conflating the 3D, the animated, the rendered, the unreal with the very real. So next, I'll draw you over to Joanna Nunez's. Blackbird. So uh, Joanna's Portuguese and there was uh, a very interesting type of musical instrument slash hunting tool that was produced. It's a very analog device for making sound and you can hear it when I do this. So that sounds coming from the opposite side of the room. So she's drawing our attention between two spaces much in the same way that her work draws our attention to the real and the simulated because whereas this is clearly meant to mimic the sound of a bird and that's why it was useful in a hunting context it's not the sound of a bird you know and it is both uh, it's got an interesting recent history because it's been a kind of a banned object this both this form of hunting and of using this technology for hunting is now banned within portugal so the object itself has got this transitional life but she's also trying to think about the real and the virtual and how blurry and indistinct those two things are by also sampling, rendering, reproducing the sounds of the blackbird, which is what this is meant to be em uh, emulating. So there's this kind of pull between these two worlds that she's asking us to think about through our own physical engagement with this sort of strange simulation. So simulation and simulacrum, which will come up again and again in these works. So this is part of the performance we're going to see at 7 o'clock, the first performance tonight, which is from Ping Ping. Um, and the reason why this is moving now is because a lot of you are looking at it. So what it is, it's using facial recognition algorithms to look through the mirror at whatever faces can be detected in it by the algorithmic system. And every time it detects a face, it moves the, the knife on a little spot. and. Uh, Effectively, Ping Ping's really interested in this Lacanian notion of the mirror self, 
and she's asking us to both kind of participate in this strangely violent action while also being passive. Because just standing in front of a mirror doesn't feel like you're participating in action. But in this instance, it does. So she's kind of blurring these lines between action and passivity, violence and non-violence, because it feels violent, while right now there is no violence occurring. So there's this nice blur between these two things. And there's a, an extra performative element to it, which I won't spoil, because you will see it at 7 o'clock with Pink Pink today. So uh, what then Gao's um, uh, vow training system Gao has been working at, on like the science of how to uh, communicate to other Chinese people, as Gao is, how to learn English. You know, Gao has been here for 15 months and has been working, as everyone does, who is a visitor to England, on their English, particularly when studying at a MA level, which is very sophisticated. So Gao has been thinking about how best he can use his time here to help other people in his situation. So this system actually uses uh, some really sophisticatedly done, uh, again, facial recognition to train people, specifically Chinese speakers, on a certain set of vowel sounds, particularly, and other phonemes that are complex for people who are coming from a Chinese background to pronounce in English. So it's a very generous work where he's trying to kind of gamify, turn into a game, the act of helping people like him to solve the problems that just normal language training doesn't always solve. It's getting really specific about what's needed for this certain group, which is a great design project. Um, next up, we got um, Nuo Shen's uh, VR exercise game for isolation. So Nuo, like most of us, when we were stuck in isolation in January, um, she is somebody who loves the gym, works out a lot, is a real gym person, and suddenly being deprived of that situation for her was a bit of a crisis. So she was thinking about how we adapt exercise routines to home. And she was also thinking about the stories and the ways that people adapted to their home environment during lockdown. So she made a VR game, and I urge you to try it out because both this and the next VR game are really technically accomplished, and neither of these people were VR practitioners. They all developed these skills in the last four months on the course. Um, and it's a really well-polished game where you train different at-home exercises with different virtual trainers, but each of the virtual trainers all talk to you while you're exercising. And what they're saying are real life um, descriptions and discussions, recordings that Nuo has made of different people talking about their intimate experience of having to work out at home. So it's really another new way of thinking about the isolation project that we're seeing so often in so many different works, but really kind of focusing on about you know, what was self-care at that moment? It wasn't just trying not to go crazy and look at Zoom too much. It was also, how do we look after our bodies? So the next work, again, the second VR work of today, Jay Lu's uh, e-super restaurant. So Jay really did a lot of work in the last six months of thinking about how climate communication works. So she was breaking down and looking at things like the IPCC report, which is a big every seven year report on climate change. Uh, that happens, but thinking about how they were trying to communicate uh, their ideas and how they were trying to advise other people to communicate about climate change, because it's a hard thing to talk about, because it can both seem scary and present, but also abstract. So Jayi decided to make this VR game which simulates a sort of a futuristic cooking scenario that adapts to um, an after-abundance world, a world where there is no longer everything that we take for granted for today. Certain foods aren't available and we have to adapt to certain things. One of the things that she was specifically interested in is how there's a lot of research that points to the fact that jellyfish are likely to become a big part of a lot of people's diets around the world in the future because they actually thrive a lot in a lot of the conditions in the sea that are being caused by climate change. So it's a sort of a simulation, a very open um, game for like all ages really. It's kind of aimed, it's quite a cartoony style, which again, she developed all of these skills in the last six months and it's very impressively done. But it's really trying to communicate this change in behavior we're gonna to try to do. So it's in some sense preparing us for this future. The next work modeled here, as you can see, uh, is Misfitting by Ingjia Yang. So Ingjia has been working a lot, sorry Ingjia, Inja's been working a lot in the field of disability design and disability studies. Now, um, this is often a very clumsily engaged with topic, 
people tend to like wade into it, people who don't uh, have those experiences, the experience of disability, they sometimes wade into it in a kind of a saviour role and do very short, shallow uh, engagements with those topics, which is the opposite of what Inja did here. She worked and really immersed herself in the field of disability design and disability studies for the last six months. Towards which, one of the things that came out was a phrase from a writer who was deaf and writing about deaf experience, saying that it's a sense of misfitting with the world. That you don't fit with the world in, in this clear way that other people seem to do. So she's in some sense giving people who are hearing people a sense of that idea of misfitting. So she's got these objects which when you put on these, this headset, they start to spin and they kind of rattle around. They make a very acoustic sound that people who are hearing can hear but she's kind of uh, made these hybrid headsets which both are noise sensitive and also static. And so you're looking at this, uh, these sets of objects and suddenly you do not have that engagement with. But you are well aware of the fact that everybody else around you does. And it's that sense of misfitting that she was trying to present in this very open way. And I, and I really like the way that she's described the work and her work uh, in the disability space on this text, so please do give that a read. Um, next up is Celeste Muet's uh, Grow Your Garden. So Celeste is somebody who is really, really interested in science communication, particularly science communication galleries. So she's been thinking about how to do good interaction design in a science communication context. The things you see in the Science Museum and the Natural History Museum in London, for those of you who've been. So she developed this project using Max MSP mostly and a software called Reactable, where you kind of train, she's training people to grow their own garden, like learn how fertilization works. Basically, something that actually arguably we, we may all well experience during the last lockdown. So many people got into gardening. I'm sure you all know somebody who got really into gardening or growing plants during lockdown. So she's thinking about these like real core life skills that she can teach us all. And it's like quite a complex notion of fertilization and nitrogen release and different plant cycles and growing cycles. And she's trying to build it into this very kind of uh, tactile and engaging medium, but also crucially brings in so much of her own study on how does science communication work? What is good science communication at an interaction level? And I think she's done a really good job at it and like, she's hopefully gonna be somebody working in that space very soon. Stupid, like we'll all survive forever by uploading our brains to the cloud narrative. His work does a really good job of pointing out the fact that the first people who will be afford, who can afford to do that will be the rich assholes. And they're assholes. We don't necessarily want them to live forever. We'll have to put up with them forever. It's going to be Elon Musk and his racist dad, you know, like giving us their lives forever. And so what he's done is sort of simulate uh, or propose this narrative where someone has been uploaded to the, to the cloud and they're an asshole, they're a menace to their family and their friends. And he's really like, like showing that very realistic, very human side to this mythological Silicon Valley, we'll all live forever in the cloud narrative. And I really like that disruption of it because it's a very everyday understandable thing once we think about it in these contexts. We can definitely work on this. So next one is uh, Zhang Ting Li's Kids Factory. So. Zhang Ting is very interested in a certain um, sort of a, a commercial surrogate industry that exists in certain countries around the world. And she felt very moved by the plight of a lot of people who've been in commercial surrogacy, which can be a very exploitative industry of the women who participate in it. And so uh, Zhang Ting made this very nice, layered, multi-ending, high replay value 2D game exploring these very real world um, uh, uh, details that she's learned of and read about and researched about this kind of surrogacy industry in various parts of the world. And it's a very subtly done, careful and caring rendition of the plight of a lot of these women in various parts of the world. Um, Wei Feng Yao's love story is Yao's own call to say that it's okay to be in love with inanimate objects. You know, some people like really subscribe to this idea that like they really love this thing, or they really love their cat, or they really love this object in their house. And Yao was upset by the fact that people seem to always mock those people, and so she's made this really lovely and engaging game 
that is actually trying to sell all of us on the idea that all love is justified. You know, if you feel love for something, you are lucky. You know, it doesn't matter what that thing is, you should feel good about it. Uh, Sean He uh, contamination of fuels. So Sean He, like a couple of other people on the course, I've been thinking about where like abstraction and metaphor comes into complex topics, right? So Sean He's been thinking about the relationship between progress, as in like civilization is, is progressing, uh, and fossil fuels, and that inevitably technological um, expansion and technological progress, in inverted commas, for obvious reasons, has a high cost, and that as this kind of technological development happens around the world, so too does the climate crisis. So Shanghai is thinking about how to present this idea using these abstractions of like thinking about what human interaction does in a system, and he's very carefully using bits of coal that kind of carve these black patterns within the white box, leaves this indelible mark on the system that it's built in. But also, as it goes, the coal itself is collapsing, right? You know, over time, this coal will all just disappear and all it will be left is this thick black box on the inside that no longer works. And I think that's quite a poetic way of thinking about that particular problem, that particular clash between progress and the cost of it. Um, next up, we've got Nella Piantek's uh, Control and R to Reflesh. So Nella's been looking at uh, xenofeminism, cyber witch practices, these ways of thinking of like rejecting the narrative that the internet is this bad thing that drives us apart. And she's instead been looking at the ways that we build community through the internet. And internet uh, and the digital technologies that come with it, the network technologies that come with it, are part of the human process, the human need to connect, the human feeling of loss and joy. These things all come through in the tools that we make and the ways that we use them. They're not other and outside of us. There's no such thing as the real and the digital. It all happens here around us in the world. And her work is this very intimate sort of uh, narrative structured around this kind of cyber witch who is lamenting both loss and also the joy that comes with engaging with these things, but also thinking about where the tension is between the machinic and the fleshy, the body, the embodied and the emotional, and the digital and the mechanical, and pushing those two things together to see what happens. Nella will be our second performer tonight. Two more pieces down here, and then we will move to this side. Those of you upstairs, please come down. So here we have first... Uh, Yu Ching, I've forgotten the name of this of the project. Yu Ching Lu's Awakening Scent Archive. Sorry, Yu Ching. Um, this has been, for me, like, I always see people around this particular archive, and Yu Ching knows that I'm sort of often anti-smell projects, because often students come in and say, okay, I want to do a project about smell and memory. And I go, okay, someone says that every term, but okay. And they say, yeah, I want to say that you smell something, and then you remember things, and everyone remembers the same thing, right? And I'm like, no, that's not how memory works. But Yu Ching really got into the, the kind of field of scent and smell practice, both the kind of biology of it, but also our lived experience of it. And she's devised this really nice uh, sort of framing between her own experience of smell and memory and how smell triggers memory and has a very powerful relationship to memory in the human brain. And so she's built these five boxes, each of which has a particular scent that's triggered by you putting your head in it as well as objects and sounds that are triggered when you put your head in this box, that are her memories. So she's asking us to connect with her and identify with her. But also, she's constructed these other parts of the in installation, which are really almost like a mad scientist smell memory experiment in asking people to create this archive of their own um, feelings about memory and smell. And what's been interesting is watching people engage with it uh, over the last week is actually a lot of people do and are surprised by seeing a relationship between what they think about when they smell a certain thing and what people all over the world are thinking when they smell a certain thing. So Yu Ching has actually weirdly at times hit upon a strange collective unconsciousness of smell, which I'm really impressed by. Last work we're going to look at from down here is... Uh, and Ching Yi, oh my god, it's Ching Yi. We've got to do that last. Thank you, Em. Is uh, Emma Jero's Experiment 7. 
So M's been thinking about um, how to better produce multimedia experiences for performance, mostly for music performers. M's worked in the music industry for a long time, has a big passion for music and performance. But also, M's been thinking about how they, as a practitioner within this space, uh, are bringing themselves into the work. And so, in this work, M's uh, very generously brought us into a simulation of their uh, front room. And they're kind of throwing up on the screen here this combination between some ideas and experiments she's been doing in terms of audiovisual work for bands, but also trying to conflate them with their own experience of how, um, how we as practitioners are always bringing ourselves into our work. And we always bring a part of us that's very intimate and personal, no matter how abstract and universal the work should be. We're always bringing a bit of ourselves in it. And I think it's really apparent from this because Em's both experience, uh, experimenting with uh, the, the real, the kind of the rendered, um, captured world, but also inverting it with their own 3D animation and 3D interventions within these spaces to always keep this tension between the universal, but universality of what they're doing, but also themselves as a practitioner within that space. Last but not least, Ching Yi Renz. Uh, Ching Yi, what's the title of this project? In between. In between, thank you, Ching Yi. So this is a long-standing set of, it, of experiments that Ching Yi has been doing throughout the year with us. Um, Ching Yi is a non-binary artist from China who has been thinking a lot about their performance of their identity within certain technological systems, how certain technological systems see them, and what that means for our own reflections upon ourselves. So a central point of this is Ching Yi trying to uh, trick various different facial recognition systems that try to classify people in this very binary, outdated way as female or male. And so Ching Yi is trying to trick them by trying to make themselves appear either female or male in these different absurd percentages that are always trying to be applied in these facial recognition contexts to themselves. But alongside this experiment of trying to trick these systems, and really foreground the absurdity of binary classification in general. Ching Yi also invited a lot of different participants, I believe there's 700 of these images in total, to contribute their own faces, who Ching Yi then tested in these algorithmic systems, made by people like Amazon that are used all over the world, including by military forces around the world, and really brought in a wide range of participants to show the strangeness of the project. The strangers of the project are trying to assign a percentage number to something as variable and ever-changing as gender identity. With that, we're going to go to the back two rooms. So, what I'm going to do is, oh, we're doing pretty well on time. Because of social distancing, I won't drag us all in there, but what I will do is that uh, we're still going to be open for a while after the end of the um, performances, so I'll invite you to kind of enter into these spaces then. Um, but we've got two works here, one from Matt Denny and one from Shrey Katuria. So first, Matt's work. So Matt has made a, a plotter, like a 3D plotting device that uses lasers, and we all know that lasers make the best projects because they're the coolest. Uh, he's basically burning into, using the, the, the light, into this light reactive substance. These maps, maps of various parts of the UK where there is hidden buried treasure, but not the kind of treasure you want. It's the treasure that is nuclear waste. So Matt's got the maps of those parts of the UK, Cumbria and Lancashire mostly, that where there are hidden buried uh, deep in the ground, these remnants of the nuclear past, that because of the way the nuclear waste works, will be there for a very, very long time. And there's a lot of work being done in how we signpost that for future generations, signpost that what is here it should not be engaged with, that this, these places are not uh, to be uh, explored. And so Matt's been thinking about deep time in that way, of thinking about the kind of burning and fading of knowledge, that something that feels so obvious to us could pass away into memory. Or at least this is how I feel about his work and what I've really enjoyed about watching him explore this. And so what the plotter does is it burns these maps that fade as the light 
uh, the laser kind of burning fades into the phosphor. So over time it constructs these multi-layered maps that are always in a process of either being brought to life by the laser or slowly fading as the light particles basically dissipate off of the material. What I really like about this is the um, very poetic voiceover that Matt has applied on top of it, which gives us this sense of an evolving, continuous, ever-going narrative um, around the poetics of the buried, the lost, the old, the new. And I think that that's something that is really important when, talk, when engaging with nuclear waste specifically, because it is going to be with us for such a long time, and it is our legacy as part of these cultures that we exist in. And it's so easy to be unobserved, and I think Matt's work really foregrounds that. Um, Shrey Couturier's Sounds of Lamentations is next to it. Again, please do visit these after the show because they're both really stunning works. Um, Shrey is going to be performing with us. Uh, it's going to be the third person performing tonight uh, with this collaborator. Um, and uh, what they did in this work was Shrey's a drone artist um, working in um, a range of multimedia, audiovisual forms, but also with minimal um, uh, electronics. Uh, and they were thinking about, uh, as both an opera singer and a drone artist, who are both people who spent the last year, uh, year plus, here in the UK, while a lot of really hard and horrible things were happening in India. They're both uh, part of the recent Indian diasporas, both being students. Do you both students here right now? No, no. One student, one not. Thank you. Um, that what they, what they were feeling being here, being away from home, I think so many of us have felt that uh, over the last year of thinking about what it means to not be present in, when other things were happening back home that felt really hard. And Sounds of Lamentation is this really uh, honest uh, and very like, deep reflection of their own feelings and that own sense of mourning that comes with not being able to be home when hard things are happening. Along with that, there's a really lovely audio-visual um, connection where there's looped visuals from around a kind of desolate and mostly empty London that Shrey specifically was experiencing in the last uh, three months of the last lockdown. So next we'll just go upstairs, three more works, and we'll be back down to see the performances. First up is Truth by Shandi Ren. So Tia's been... Uh, really deeply engaged actually throughout her entire study here with uh, MA Interaction Design with like what is possibly like the biggest question that any of us could ask which is what is like capital T truth? Like how do we think about the way that the world is presented to us and how we navigate that recognizing that we all have our own situated knowledges that come in the world and there are many individual truths which may feel true regardless of where you are and they feel true at certain times and then not in others. So there's this notion of truth that's very slippery, but at the same time it feels very fixed. And T has been working with that metaphor in her work for a while. In this particular piece, there's a, uh, a, room, a small room constructed that appears to be this kind of fixed sculpture. And as you walk in, as soon as your body is detected within the space, the walls start to warp. So suddenly your notion of like fixity, you know, the, the idea of the room as this kind of like safe, knowable space, starts to be blurred and blended um, and, and a voiceover begins of Tia exploring uh, from a very philosophical perspective these questions about who we are, what truth means to us. She's tying in some really interesting, quite uh, in-depth references to Chinese kids TV shows as well in this as well to kind of bring in some of her own feelings about growing up uh, and also about where she is now, uh, which comes through quite a lot in all the work she does with us. Um, next we've got Mickey's story room. So, Mitchy has been, uh, she travelled here in, when was it you arrived? December last year? October. October? Um, October. Late June, no it was like June wasn't it? Yeah. June. So, Mitchy travelled late to come and join us. Uh, she arrived here six months ago. Uh, and so, she spent a lot of the time working remotely from us, right? She's like working uh, through a screen when so many of the rest of her cohort were in person. And so she had this very particular experience of the world through screens. And she was talking to us all very late at night because China is seven hours uh, in the future in terms of time zones. Um, and so Min Shi's con constructed this room full of different windows, these different views on the world that are both screens and windows. 
that record her senses of isolation and distance, but also of like travel and also of the need for nature. You know, somebody who was inside so much um, and looking out onto like the natural world around her. She was really thinking about how when we look at nature through a window or through a screen, what is our real experience of that? Well, we know we're not in it. What is that? Does it still do something for us? Like, what can it do for us? What does that um, that folding of space do? You know, does it do anything? And so many of these views are these very, very nice, small, intimate views of nature that Minchi presents to us that sometimes we miss even in London. But Minchi, being a new visitor to London, was really interested in the, the new animals that weren't from where she had just come from. And it's a nice way of reminding ourselves of actually like the everyday nature within London, uh, you know, specifically pigeons. <laughs> so the last work is Ying Jie Liang's Object Storytelling, The Power of Things. So Ying Jie is really interested in thinking about different forms of experience mostly held by people, again, who don't occupy uh, the sort of identity or maybe the sort of body, which often is um, viewed as a safe or quote-unquote normal one in the space that they are um, in. So Ying has been thinking specifically about the difference between safe spaces and uh, this notion of a brave space, of how we, as sometimes people who occupy bodies that don't feel safe, can construct forms of safety for us, um, senses of homeliness, um, and through this, uh, Inja created this desk, which is actually kind of a model of her own desk at home, um, that is filled with these objects. And as you pick up each object, the object tells a story through the screen, through the desktop monitor that's in the work. Uh, and each of the objects are taken from her own interviews with people about the notion of what they think a safe space is. So it's this notion of like safety and intimacy, of calm, you know, constructed through an object like a Rubik's Cube. You know, these strange things that sometimes we get a, a bizarre sense of like safety or security out of because they've got a special meaning to us. I'm sure we've all got these objects at home that are meaningless to everybody else, but to us they've got substantial and important emotional connection. And luckily, uh, Inche could um, get those nice stories out of her participants and they allowed her to make these replicas of these objects from their own home. So it's basically a, a space that seeks itself to be sp safe while also presenting these very different views about what makes a safe space and these different experiences of safety, calm and belonging. Great, thank you very much everybody. So let's go downstairs, back down to the gallery. We've got three performances and then we're gonna go to the pub.
Nella Biontech. We must get lost within all these wires. Some resembling cut off limbs, simply left to rot. Some become replaceable, while others under the influence morph into tentacles that crawl outwards, expanding rapidly like a new type of root that overgrows its predecessor. Entangled in networks, they enmesh with the soul they once came from. Extracted, violated, and processed by the hands of us, colonizers now raped and abandoned, you are left to rot and decay in your limbs. Is there only one kind of touch you know? Consumptive, greedy, impassive. Perhaps it is not you that is cold, hard, or artificial, but so is rather our condition, a predisposition to view flesh other than our own as inferior. Perhaps inferior because we cannot comprehend anything else with a similar drive for existential meaning, or one that can conjure an equally intense set of emotions. Why are we so blind and so easily forget that everything we have around us is made of flesh? Flesh of another flesh that we do not perceive as flesh. For what reasons? Because we simply believe it is less alive than our own bodies are? I acknowledge the land you once came from. I acknowledge that you come from the ground and will one day enjoy me there. Born and processed into this world on a whim of another. You and I both haunted. See? We share many things in common. Yet the difference is I'm a parasite. Call me a leech, as I feed off your flesh to sustain myself, to grow, to feel alive. As I press control R to reflesh, 
I acknowledge where you come from, how you were born, and how you're decaying alongside my own body. How you're evolving alongside me. How you're allowing me to find myself within the fissures of existing technological systems you provide. I acknowledge that you allow me to re-examine my own flesh and to redefine what it means to be present, to connect through geographies and time frames, and to simply live on as my body is a decaying vessel, my memory is glitchy, you allow my existence to be more than just a breath in the moment. You remind me who I am and who I've been, who I can be, cosmic. And there's something different about me today as I recognize how I am an error, and I feel liberated by it. I am a digital native. I know no life other than the one tangled with you. Our flesh merges as you attach to my skin, sink into my body, become an appendage, a callus I carry with me everywhere, carried on my back. Attached to my waist. Molding into my ears. Bending the bones of my fingers. You swallow my thoughts and let them live a second life. You're better at remembering things, however, your brain is also finite. You need help from other devices to store your memory just like you store mine. And we become a massive network and meshed. And I'm losing sight of its boundaries. You and I, inseparable until death do us apart. I invite you to engulf my flesh, to hug it, and please I beg you, stay close, don't leave me. You're the only one I need to see, to hear, to, to connect with myself for the connections you facilitate allow me to understand who I am what I stand for and what do I want I strive to become a leakage 
leaking through existing assemblages, digital architectures, and physical materiality to manifest as hauntings. I want to become a haunting and feel liberated by doing so. Haunting others, haunting myself with reflections of the past. Photographs, handwriting, videos, voice notes. See, I rely on you to remind me what came before the state I am in. I spread my disease onto you, infecting you with decay as I weigh you down with my longing for remembering and continuously connecting. Just like me, you might have a hard time recognizing yourself in your past skins. Your flesh is no longer reminiscent of what it used to be. The aluminum from India, iron from Australia, lithium and copper from Chile, gold from Nevada, now condensed, wrapped in a tiny package, shiny and chrome. Just like me, you're a mesh of different cultures, touched by different people, born and metamorphosed in different locations. Just like me, you have no home, not a single ancestral ground to bow to. We disappear, as now we belong nowhere and can take place anywhere. I am to disappear. Why not take agency of it? As I reside within these devices, I exist in the meshes of presence and absence. I explore myself through digital material, stretching, reworking, and viewing its infrastructure as architecture for dialogue. I am a cyber feminist for an hour. As I wander through the digital, absorbed by the experience of being within its systems and using that experience to reflect on myself. <sighs> we have processed and assembled you to make ourselves feel more, see more, so we could reach further and extend our bodies beyond, beyond geographies, beyond physical presence, beyond the sleeve we were given at birth. We leave imprints of our hopes and desires on your flesh over and over again, unable to stop. Your flesh has become our heroine as we suck out the life out of you. We drown in an illusion of infinite progress. We fuse with the other, blurring many boundaries on our way of nature, human, technology, of the digital and corporeal, of affection and exploitation.
Is this a funeral? If so, whose is it?
Thank you, thank you everybody.